photography is a very lonely world. You know, and and and, and of all the macrocosms of photography, architecture is probably the, the loneliest. You know, they may call you a specialist on a particular subject, but I'm always against that. I don't want to be a specialist in anything. Welcome to yet another episode of Cross Border Conversation, a still original video series that features talks between thought leaders from across geographical boundaries and varied creative disciplines. Today, we bring to you two professionals who in their practices of many years have been narrating stories centered around the world of built environment, punctuated with their own perspective, driven by cultural, social, economic, and political factors. One who used photography as a medium, while the other who uses words to bring forth the expression that architecture or design seeks to convey or fail in some context. On behalf of Stir, I welcome Edmund Sumner and Vladimir Beloglovitsky to this episode of Cross-Border Conversation. Edmund Sumner, one of the highly regarded architectural photographers today, Edmund has been collaborating with leading architects, publishers, editors, and curators globally since 1998. His clients include Tarawando, Riva, Spears and Majors, Vitra, Burberry, the National Government of Kuwait, to name a few. In addition to his domestic photography, London-based Edmund travels far and wide and is equally comfortable working with emerging talent and mega studios globally. He's often found shooting in India, Japan, Mexico, the Middle East, and the USA. Edmund regularly contributes to international publications and compiled books, some of which include Architecture of Eden, New Architecture in Japan, Architecture of the Olympics, and the latest one called Indian House that has been delayed until 2021 due to current COVID situation. Edmund, while growing up within a family of architects and designers, calls himself the black sheep in the family as he is the only one who did not study or practice architecture or interior design. While many people grew up reading magazines such as, such as National Geographic or Vogue, Edmund was reading Thomas in Architectural Review. It was an interest in those magazines that Edmund began considering a career in photography. Edmund today will be in conversation with Vladimir Beloglovsky, an American curator and critic. Vladimir practiced architecture for 12 years before he founded the New York-based nonprofit organization called Curatorial Project, which focuses on curating and designing architectural exhibitions worldwide. Referred as talented scientists in the architecture criticism, Vladimir's works, ex works explore a wide range of architectural subjects which span probing interviews with illustrious practitioners to curating books on recent architectural history. As a columnist and a regular contributor with various international publications, he has interviewed over 350 leading architects and has written 10 books, including Iconic New York, Conversation with Peter Eisenman, Harry Sadler Life Work, and Soviet Modernism. He's also curated over 50 international exhibitions of which includes the chess game for the Russian Pavilion at the 11th Venice Architectural Biennale in 2008. Vladimir is also a columnist with Stir, who puts together meticulous reviews and compelling conversations bringing the best of architecture from across the globe. We thank Vladimir for his regular contribution to Stir. Vladimir's underground writing career began at the age of 31 when his interest in writing was triggered by his father-in-law during September 11 attack in New York in 2001, when he lost his job and had two months long pause. In 2017, while working on an exhibition at Tsinghua University in Beijing, Ladabi met Li Zhuangdong, who's considered a true guru and undisputed authority to many leading young Chinese architects. That meeting ended up with not only Vladimir's one semester teaching tryst at the university, but also his upcoming book called China Dialogues that features interviews with 21 leading architects in China. Welcome, Edmund. Welcome, Vladimir. We now leave the room to the two of you while you imbibe into each other's practices and expertise and converse on the very nuances of narrating stories in two different mediums. <laughs> Hi, Edmund. How are you doing? Yes, I'm very well, Vladimir, and uh, nice to nice to put a name, uh, put a face to a name. 
Yes, very nice to meet you finally. Um, you know, uh, Amit just um, uh, talked about um, how you started. It's, it's very interesting. It seems that we are coming from very opposite uh, uh, situations, uh, very opposite backgrounds. You grew up in a family of architects, uh, as I heard, and uh, you um, decided to do something quite different related to architecture, but nevertheless different. And uh, I grew up uh, in a family of non-architects and uh, came across for some reason architecture and decided to uh, dive into this uh, paradigm and devote my life to it. So I just wonder, um, you know, why you decided not to pursue uh, architecture uh, in a way directly, uh, but yet to um, you, you, obviously you had a lot of uh, knowledge and interest in, in it. So I just wonder how photography came into your life. Um, well, if I'm going to be totally honest, it looked um, it looked really hard work. <laughs> it, looked, um, it looked also very um, very involved. It looked very sort of involved and sort of drawn out. Uh, and I think um, I've always been I've always been quite interested in um, sort of uh, uh, adventure and doing things quite quickly. I'm, my, uh, my attention moves on all the time. I don't think I would have the ability um, technically or, or um, in terms of in my sort of interpersonal skills to be able to sort of sit with one project and one team for, for, for years and sort of convince them about things that, you know, you might or you might not do at a certain stage if, if the right money or the right budget was, was available. I sort of like to be able to do things um, and then move on. Um, so, so I guess, I guess, I guess that's why. And I think um, with my family, I was always very interested in photography um, from a super young age. And then I think around the age of around uh, eight or nine, I started going along uh, to shoot with my father when he was hiring photographers to um, shoot uh, projects. And um, you know, just a little light bulb in my head came on. That I thought that would be um, something that would be quite fun to do. So, uh, so you actually met uh, some photographers, right? Uh Wow. I did, yes, yes, and that's right. I I, I met a few photographers. More, I mean, my, I want to say my, my, my father was more sort of interior architect, so um, sort of interior design. So uh, I guess what I mean by interior de de design is it's not sort of interior decoration. It's quite sort of architectural. So um, a lot of the photographers he was commissioning were um, sort of interiors photographers rather than sort of hard architectural uh, photographers and um, I just um, I, I liked everything about it. I liked um, you know, from the from the little canisters of film to the to to to, to the equipment, um, but also I just found the person the, the, the personalities quite uh, quite intriguing. They all seem to be very sort of high energy and um, and I think later on, why I started working as an assistant um, around 1997. Um, and that's quite a crucial, that's quite a crucial time. I think I was very, very lucky because that was the same year that Wallpaper magazine got launched. Um, so before that, architectural photography was a real sort of super niche, sort of quite, quite technical, quite geeky almost, uh, largely shot on 10 by 8, um, quite often in black and white. So when I started assisting, there were, you know, around the Wallpaper magazine started and suddenly, you know, you had sort of, models and it was suddenly became very very hip very trendy very sort of sexy and um, yeah part of the mainstream yeah yeah i think part of the part of the mainstream but i think when i when i started um i suddenly realized that i sort of understood and enjoyed interpreting the uh, the, the spaces um because i mean in photography architectural photography essentially you're um you're interpreting someone else's um um, design someone else's work um, so uh, and I and I just I think that's where all the background my background really helped me I had a sort of empathy I think for, for all the characters involved and um, and the space itself so uh, I found it incredibly enjoyable 
Um, so if I could ask, what, 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 what what was what is your background? Um, what did your what did your family? What, what sort of professions were they, were they involved with? Yes, so uh, uh, actually both of my parents are engineers, um, but uh, it's uh, kind of unrelated to architecture. Uh, my mom was designing toys, and my father was into cars, uh, mechanical engineer. Uh, but for me, uh, I guess I was uh, always interested in, uh, I wouldn't say architecture, but I was interested in uh, history part of uh, buildings. So I always liked uh, exploring buildings in my hometown, Odessa, Odessa in Ukraine, which is uh, a relatively young city, but uh, it was largely built in uh, uh, 18, late 18, um, early 19th uh, century, uh, mid 19th century. Uh, but for me, interest really started uh, when we left uh, the Soviet Union. We actually immigrated, and that's uh, that was a, a major impact on my obviously life. And uh, we didn't immigrate straight. We first went to Vienna and then Rome. In Rome, we had to meet American uh, consul. Uh, to get American visas to go to the U.S. And uh, spending two months in Rome, uh, that was the first kind of introduction to what architecture is or even could be. At that time, it was, um, uh, you could not uh, come across contemporary works of architecture in Rome. This was 1989. Um, but for some reason, uh, just seeing um, ancient Rome um, led me to believe that I, that's what I would like to do. I would like to do architecture. And for some reason, I felt uh, that I would like to do contemporary architecture. And I even started doing sketches, um, dreaming about architecture that I have never seen anywhere in magazines, in books, in real life. I just can't, I did not come across that. And when I, uh, when we came to New York, um, I just started looking for, because I was 19, uh, I actually started college in uh, Russia, uh, in Ukraine, in, in the former Soviet Union, but it was uh, uh, nuclear physics that I studied. And um, so when I came to New York, I just started looking for colleges where I could study architecture. And this is how I discovered it. But I, and I found, uh, I was accepted uh, by uh, a perfect place, Cooper Union, uh, where uh, actually everybody they accept is a kind of novice in architecture. People know very little about architecture. And that's exactly what they want because they want uh, people coming into this profession and completely reinventing it. So that was uh, my beginning. In fact, uh, at the very beginning when um, the first class we had, they would give uh, big name architects to different students and they would ask them to prepare a, a presentation. And I was uh, asked to do it on Frank Lloyd Wright. And when I was given the name, and this was in a big public place where we had many, many students, and they would say, Vladimir, you get Frank Lloyd Wright. That was the name I never heard before. So that was quite an embarrassment. I even asked for, how do you spell that? And uh, the person who was sitting next to me, he was kind enough to say that uh, he, he'll, he'll spell it for me, don't worry. <laughs> So when I went to the library, I, you know, I discovered that that, that was Frank Lloyd Wright, and then there was the rest of architecture. And um, and, and then you and then you you worked in practice in in, in New York, correct? Yes, you know, uh, when I graduated, I was lucky enough to uh, study in uh, Cooper Union under uh, John Haydick. He was the dean at that time. He was the dean for 25 years. And uh, when it was very close to my graduation, he asked me to come into his office. Uh, well, he was extremely generous. Uh, you know what he did? He, 
he asked me, uh, what are you going to do after you graduate? And um, he was the first person who actually asked me that question um, during the entire time. You know, I actually spent six years at Cooper Union and I never bothered to even think about that. What am I going to do after I graduate? And he recommended for me to go to Spain and uh, look for work there. He actually gave me a recommendation letter uh, to Rafael Manel, uh, who didn't hire me, but I ended up working for another architect in Madrid and um, left Madrid after about a year working there. And then we reconnected with that architect 10 years later and that meeting 10 years later really, like, literally changed my life because he um, asked me to go to represent his project in Australia. And this is how I, um, that, that led to meeting a, a whole number of other people. So it's a very interesting how incidental uh, life and profession and career uh, can be. It, 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 it seems to me that you're you're someone who's very very aware of the um, the possibilities of random chance, um, taking thinking about opportunities and um, the, the sort of power of serendipity, almost sort of. Um, I think you know the secret is that I uh, didn't think about it. I still don't think about it. I am. I'm a little bit more aware of that, that a single conversation could change your life, literally. And that's why you really have to pay attention to everybody who is near you and who is talking to you. And if they are not talking to you, maybe you should be talking to them. Uh, so I'm aware of that. But at the same time, I'm very open. And I'm not trying to strateg strategically plan my life. And maybe yeah. that a secret, but I also I'm not afraid to uh, make a, a drastic change, drastic mm -hmm. change, like uh, working in an office for 12 years. One day I said, you know, enough is enough. I'm not coming back. I, I'm doing something else. I, I didn't just do something else. I did, you know, uh, I did something underground that I liked and I decided to put that underground into you know my kind of main focus that's what i uh, but it's uh, it's important to uh, not to know you know when you when you don't know there are more chances uh, more chances that something will happen wonderful you know both of us uh, travel a lot mm -hmm. uh, i actually um, you know, for, for a while, especially when I was a student, I always uh, uh, envied uh, people who, you know, other students who uh, traveled the world. Because when I was a student, it was on, only uh, when I was, I guess, in my third year, my fourth year, when I had a chance to, uh, to go to Europe, to go to places like Paris and London and... Uh, mm. um, you know, Barcelona and others. Um, and uh, there was a period when I could not afford to travel. Um, I actually didn't even have uh, a passport or any citizenship for the first uh, few years when I was in the US. But then eventually I uh, discovered that. And I know that you travel a lot, uh, but not only you travel a lot, but you uh, go back to certain places again and again. And I noticed that you uh, particularly go a lot to India and a lot to Japan. And I just wonder why these two places and uh, what... Well, I think, well, I, think uh, I, I, I mean, I think it would be free, really, the, the, the main areas that I'm, I'm working a lot. Um, I think it'd be India, um, Mexico, and um, Japan. I guess in terms of, I, you know, I've always sort of sought out um, excitement and travel. And um, I mean, in some ways I could play it very, very safe and I could stay in the UK 
and you know I could work for for for, for practices uh, in UK, which which I which I do. But I mean, one could sort of do a lot more of that. I guess um, I guess there's a slight escapism in the work that I do. Um, also, I find um, some of the politics in 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 certain uh, in in certain um, scenes, architectural scenes in certain countries. Um, um, I, in, in a way, I, I just sort of like to be able to keep on sort of moving. And I think, um, you know, in some ways, I sort of describe myself uh, as a sort of cultural conduit. So um, I'm quite proud of the fact that, um, you know, I can photograph a project let's say in mexico or in uh, india or in japan and i have the ability to fuse that with international magazines uh and then sort of kind of spin the you know f f f f you know so which is which is great for the architects that i'm working with but al but also sort of great for for myself it's it's exciting um it's exciting I think also creatively, I find there's a huge liberation in working in in, in slightly unfamiliar environments, because maybe you're not um, uh, you're not aware, uh, or you're not adhering to sort of cultural um, norms. So you're seeing things slightly differently. You know, I'm I'm not going to lie. I um, it's 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 exciting um i like to travel i like to and i like to be able to um you know see and help promote uh, architecture from different countries um and use the network that i've sort of uh, created uh and to help you know get projects and get countries more 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 seen so uh, with India in particular, um, I first went to India um, in 1991, and um, it was kind of, I'd finished school, it was a bit of a sort of rite of passage, I was a bit of a hippie and a backpacker, and I had a six pack and very long hair, and, and I went around India, and, and um, you know, that was... That was that was from that was you know lots of fun, but but essentially you you were hanging out with other people from from Europe or from England, and you know not really meeting so many so Indians. And then I think I went back on my honeymoon with um, uh, my wife uh, uh, Yuki um, in 2000, and this again a very similar. I did a similar sort of circuit, but staying in slightly nicer uh, hotels. And I mean, by this time, by this stage, I was. You know, well on my way to becoming, you know, a photographer on my own right, but not, not fully. So a friend of mine was the architecture editor of uh, Wallpaper magazine. So, and I, you know, went to see him, and he's like, okay, no, that's great, and he gave me a whole. Lot. And he was very, very interested in the architectural scene in India. So he gave me a list of um, studios to look at, and I met uh, Dashi and. Um, I met uh, Gujit Mataru and um, and some others, and um, I I you know I've always loved India, so it just it just sort of seemed you know they're very open to doing more work. So um, and I think since then I've been going to India sort of once twice a year uh, since. In fact, I mean I was there, I'm in India up until until late February this year, um, and. Um, then with uh, with Mexico, um, it was initially via a commission from Tado Ando to photograph a house in Monterey. Um, so I kind of jumped on that. It was just it looked an amazing, amazing house. Uh, Cas it's called Casa Monterey, high up above the mountains. But but Mexico was a you know it's a different beast. At the, the time I went to Monterey it was the the time that the narco wars were were really warming up and i think about a week before i arrived there were sort of 18 bodies sort of hanging under the bridges and it was all sort of quite uh but um i really liked the people and i loved the work and um i think uh um and then with with japan i've been working in japan for uh, i mean i think the, the connection probably was through my wife who's japanese and um i think 
visually, I think um, Japan is probably where I cut my teeth the most. So I first went out there in 98 uh, and then 99. And I was sort of st stopping being assistant and beginning to um, shoot my own work. So, you know, obviously as a young, impressionable photographer, you know, Japan was just off the charts. So um, I should have probably explained those in different order. There was Japan first, India, Mexico, and, and then I'm doing another, a lot of other things. But, but strangely, I've, I've noticed you've done a lot of stuff in China. Um, I've always been slightly, I've never been that interested. And I think it's, I mean, ironically, I am more interested in China now than I was some years ago, because some years ago, it seemed to me that China was sort of imp um, importing a lot of big name architects. And then there was this sort of uh, almost like a trickle down. I think they had to engage local studios. And but it was, and uh, you know, a lot of the photography, architectural photography community were all charging out to, to, to China. And, you know, after the latest Zaha Hadid or uh, Hull or, you know, all these big name star architects. But that was really not what I was interested in. I think I would sort of describe what I what I'm interested in architecturally is more of a sort of contrarian um, play. I, I, I like to go in the other direction. Well, um, you know, it's interesting uh, what you are saying. Um, you know, uh, China was not ready for you uh, because it was, um, you know, it, it just started um, that kind of uh, architecture uh, done by the local Chinese architects. It is something uh, very recent phenomenon. Yeah, uh, it didn't really exist before, and that's why you were not interested. But you should be interested in that now, yeah. uh, because you know, um, in 1993, they allowed for the first time to open in independent offices in China. So imagine in 1993, just they, they just started to open. Uh, when I say they, uh, I mean, I think there was only one person who opened it, Yun Ho Chan. And um, others followed uh, some years later, it, not immediately. So by the year 2000, you know, nothing was yet built. In fact, all of the most famous architects in China today, they only, um, you know, started graduating, by the way, mainly American universities after they graduated local universities. They only started graduating in early 2000s. So even if you went to China uh, 15 years ago, you would see nothing, nothing um, yeah. as far as that. And then in 2001, um, the, the, um, China won uh, Beijing 2008 Olympic uh, bid. And this is when they started preparing, and this is when they started asking big name architects that you mentioned, come to China and build their dreams. And at that time, um, the local architects could not compete uh, because they were still at school. They were not even practicing at that point. So then they started coming back and earlier, earliest uh, big name uh, architects known today in China, uh, they started opening up, only opening up in early 2000s. They did form their practices very quickly and they started building very quickly, but they needed at least a few years. And starting from 2000, uh, really 2008, uh, you can see major projects by the Chinese, such as by Wushan, uh, 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 sorry, Wang Shu, Wang Shu, uh, did his Ningbo Museum in 2008. And that's probably, um, you know, really the beginning, that great architecture made by, designed by uh, local architects is possible. And by now you have literally hundreds of incredible buildings all over China. Now China is ready for you. You should, uh, and I can introduce you to many yeah, no, no, no. I mean, I mean, I mean, that would be fantastic. I mean, there, there are. Uh, I mean, you. Might, there's one particular project. Well, there's a couple. There's one, and and the name of the practice uh, escapes me. But it's um, it's uh, a hotel in an old in, in an old uh, cement factory, 
Um, this, this is by Vector Architects by okay. Dong Gong. Oh, it's incredible. This I mean, is it's outside just... of um, outside of uh, Gulin in the yeah, mountain. I, know. I mean, Vector, Vector. I mean, their their work. I mean, is just just superb. Um, and um, and there's, it seems to me there's a few sort of similar practices connected with them. I mean, there's I've seen one of a chapel that sort of you know and the, either the sea comes in or there's one. That's the, the same sea. architect. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there's one I think called the, the fisherman's house, which is this wonderful sort of. Connection. Yes, that's the same architect. So, but yeah. I think in a way I'm I, I'm I'm a, I'm a great believer in. Um, I mean, when I started in photography. As I sort of said, I had that thing of finding it um, relatively easy to interpret and to understand the spaces, but there was also a lot of coincidences. So, it, 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 so, and I'm a f firm believer that when you're on the when you're on the right path in life, things seem to automatically fall into place. So, I think it was very kind of you to 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 to, to say that China wasn't sort of ready. I mean, I think I wasn't ready, but but I I, I know I don't think. It's it's slightly over flattering me. I mean, I think more sort of like I'd love to go out there and do some things, but but I'm but I'm really very very pleased that I didn't sort of go out because you know you had all the sort of star architect architectural photographers, you know, the Ewan bands and people just chasing all the big name European architects, you know, and it, it, you know if I see another back street with you know with sort of uh, construction worker having a cup of tea with a new building in the background, you know, that's, that's not really what, what I'm interested in. I wonder um, how do you initiate uh, projects? Um, is it uh, ever up to you? Uh, for example, I know that when you went to Japan, you also photographed a number of contemporary architects. And uh, I wonder who, who commissioned that? Was that your own initiative? Well, I think if you, I think if you, I think if you sit down and wait for the perfect commission at the perfect time, you'll be waiting for a very, 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 very long time. Really, more what you do is you build up, a, you try and build up a certain sort of uh, reputation or a certain sort of, um, uh, yeah, I guess reputation is the best word. And then, and then I think what um, typically you would do would be that I think. You know, I think in a way, I mean, uh, earlier when, when I was sort of describing my way itself as a little bit like a cultural conduit, by that, what I mean is a lot of architects want to be published and a lot of magazines want to publish. But in a way, I'm the sort of the middle ground between that. So when I go to certain countries, I might talk to certain magazines about projects that might be happening, and then I might talk to the those projects about magazines that might be interested uh, and that's that's sort of in the early stages and then I think and then I think as things sort of develop um, then you then people say okay well if you're going to be there I'm going to do this and then it start and then it sort of starts to to build so and then I think you sort of get one project and two and then you kind of try and put things together but I think the whole notion that you know you're sitting there waiting for the email to ping about you know going off specifically to doing one project for one person for one reason. So, so I sort of try and put a lot of things together, but I, you know, I think in photography, you've slightly got to be very open to that. You've got to, um, I don't know what, I mean, the word hustle sounds a little bit crass, but, but in a way you, you do need to kind of get something sort of going in, in, in that respect with Mexico. With Mexico, I mean, I think a lot of it happened because of the connection with Ando. Um, I've, um, I was photographing for Ando, then I went down to Casa Wabi when it was opening up. And um, they had, I, I, I was supposed to be shooting it over two days, and I think I ended up saying about seven, because it was just, it was 
great shoot, but it was just one long sort of drinks party, really. It was brilliant. And you had, at that time, it was, you had a lot of the great and good from the curators to artists to to architects were all staying or popping in. So I got to meet a lot of people. Uh, and, um, and then, you know, I think recommendations. Um, I mean, the one thing that's sort of changing, and it's a real concern, is is that magazines are, you know, they're all they're all going bust. Um, you know, some of the magazines that inspired me to to start in photography, they're all they're all going bankrupt, or, or you know, or the you know the fees that you're being paid from magazines using your work are probably ten percent of what they were twenty years ago. So it's it's. Uh, it's a difficult environment, to be honest. I want to show you a little video that I made. Um, um, I made in um, Calcutta, in uh, West Bengal, for Abin Chowdhury. Ah, okay. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Yeah. yeah. This, this is a, a community temple, right? In Kolkata. Yeah. yeah, it's it's quite sweet. It's it's a series of little pro bono um, community uh, projects by uh, a Calcutta based um, architect who's uh, incredibly successful. And this is his his home his home village. Um, so, and this, this kind of really, you know, it, 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 this kind of shows in a way what I like to work on and what to like to work with. Um, I like the sort of the duality. Um, I mean, I also, you know, I will also do, um, you know, more commercial projects, but I think if it was just commercial, shiny new office things or, you know, I, I love things that are sort of just raw and beautiful. And, and that was just one of the most beautiful little scenes that um, uh, I've come across. I spent a whole, well, I spent yeah, probably about two, two days photogra photographing it and videoing it at different times. And, and both of you have covered architecture from various parts of the world, um, from both writing as well as photography perspective, from India to Japan, to Mexico, to China, uh, 
to the European countries as well as pretty, uh, UK and London. Um, some of the old, uh, some of the uh, countries have a very strong design language. Some of the countries have very, very strong, powerful traditional language. And today, when you look at Chinese architecture or what is being built in China or what is being built in India or what is being built in Japan, um, somewhere both of you feel that, that there is a dilution of their own rooted language, uh, which is not getting reflected into the work which you're documenting or you're writing about, where basically uh, the vocabulary of design in context to the culture or the tradition which the culture is evolving from. I've been going to uh, China in the late, in the last couple of years, uh, several years, probably more than uh, to other places. So it's uh, probably, um, you know, more relevant uh, to talk about that. And uh, I have to say, first of all, that uh, I'm really happy uh, that <clears throat> uh, architecture, uh, which is done by the Chinese, is in China is now uh, by far more relevant and uh, uh, more important uh, than anything else done by other architects. It is absolutely unique because it's shaped by very different perspectives. In a way, it's, uh, it is related to uh, the local culture and how our architecture was done in China before. But at the same time, it is uh, designed by architects who are not only were trained in China, but also went outside and spent many years outside of China. And they look at China um, as Chinese, but also as, uh, you know, through Western's, Western uh, perspective, uh, Western eyes, for sure, because what they're doing is, uh, I don't think this could ever be done by uh, architects who never traveled or spent time outside of China. So it's very interesting to see this hybrid, this mixture of uh, attitudes and perspectives and visions. Uh, you know, when we look at the Chinese cities and we look at the, their scale, uh, we, we think it's Chinese, but it's, um, in a way, a lot of it is done by Western planners and Western attitudes. And uh, we see very Western looking buildings, uh, especially skyscrapers. Uh, they're not coming from China, they're coming from elsewhere. And there is a certain anger and, um, and they want to change that. They want to go back to uh, their own history. And another anger is not only what is happening as far as building the new cities and building new uh, neighborhoods from scratch, but also completely erasing what was built there before. Um, there is also this uh, local uh, kind of attitude. Um, they value, um, you know, new shiny things a lot more than their own uh, history. But this is changing. It's been changing in the last, um, you know, at least uh, 10, five years. And now uh, chances are, uh, if you have an existing building, it's probably going to stay and the new will somehow develop over it or in it or interact with it. It's, it will not be demolished. And uh, for example, there is a wonderful project by Narian Hu in Shanghai um, on the West. Um, well, this is in, in Shanghai. And um, that's a historical building from the 20s that the client wanted to, to erase and build something completely new, a new uh, hotel, uh, and the architects insisted that it should be uh, transformed. And uh, that was one of the earliest projects that has done it. There was a demonstration uh, against uh, you know, climate change in New York uh, some months ago, and uh, they interviewed one 18-year-old student, high school student, and uh, the, the lady said, um, um, she was very fearful of the future. And she said that uh, um, the future is so terrible. <clears throat> I will do anything in my power that, <clears throat> that the future will never come. 
And so we have a very different um, attitude now towards the future. And architects um, pick it up and, and they uh, see that. And uh, you can see uh, a kind of change in attitude in many of the projects, which uh, more about comfort and more about uh, the past and passage of time as opposed to the future. Uh, at, at the same time, um, what was always uh, um, kind of valued in architecture, uh, architects authorship, that is getting diminished and um, it's becoming much less about personal expressions and a lot more about, uh, um, you know, uh, this, the, the atmosphere. Sounds, sounds almost uh, what you're talking about is slight nostalgia. I think that you know, nostalgia is a very, very interesting thing culturally because I, I used to always see nostalgia as a, as a dirty word. It was something that politicians would whip up, oh, the good old times, or, you know, they'd blame someone about this or that, and they'd, and they'd hark back to a sort of time that was very rose-tinted, and they would sort of... But the thing is, I think nostalgia, for me, it's no longer um, a dirty word. It's about looking back at things as just being simpler and happier. Um, when you've been given a project to shoot, Edmund, um, I'm sure an architect tell you a certain brief or give you, hey, this is what my building is and this is what uh, the project is all about. This is how or what he or she conceived. So there is a, there is a narrative which an architect uh, or a designer is giving it to you. At the same time, when you visit the space and when you start looking at from your lenses, um, you add your own layer of narrative to it. Um, where does the where does that meet your own perspective, your own narrative, which you see of a built environment versus what was being briefed to you as what that project is supposed to be standing for? You know, I guess a skillful photographer will, um, I, I mean, I've got this thing that basically I try and give architects what they need. That's not necessarily what they've asked for, but with, with an architect, they might've been working on a project for, um, you know, two, three, four years, five years, you know, it's, it's, you know, and the, in the beginning there was probably the love and the joy and there was the renders, there was all excitement and the clients happy. And then as things go on, I imagine there's problems and budgets get cut and, you know, all the sort of, all the nice bits get value engineered out. And by the end, you know, the, the, the project, I mean, if the relationship is still together with the, the architect and the client, you know, there's, there's still, there's a lot of sort of angst. So in, in, in a way with, with photography, you know, what, what we, what I do is um, on a psychological level is I give closure. Photographer goes in and it's like, it's like you put it to bed, it, it's finished and you get a lovely set of, and it gets almost uh, immortalized. And then it's almost, I, and I hear this again and again and again, it's almost like they, they think of the project in a new light. It comes back to life for them. You know, if you're a sk skillful photographer, you will be able to pick up the, um, the important parts of the project. And then that project um, sort of on a sort of crazy psychological level has a life of its own. And then it does this really interesting thing, especially with social media, is that the project is set free. Um, so, you know, when I turn on my phone and you know, Instagram's binging up with some of my pictures or, you know, of my client's work. And I think for the clients themselves, and what's fascinating is that, you know, is that there's that idea of your sort of giving closure and almost sort of rebirth to a project. You know, people are, you, 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 you know, so many architects say, you know, I'm, I'm in love with the project again, I'm seeing it. And then, so it's, it's, it's very interesting. So in terms of, you know, what a photographer does, it's with, with architecture, it's, um, it's wonderfully complicated. I think, I, I think, you know, also online is, is under siege as well. I mean, it's, it's not going to stop at magazines. Um, yeah. but, but, I, but listen, I'm an optimist. I'm always an optimist. And things, the, you know, the, 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 the advantages of the digital revolution, because it really is a revolution, that far, far, far outweigh. And, you know, when something better comes along, you, you jump on it. You know, history has taught us that. 
Um, in terms of what is going to come out next in terms of technology, um, um, well, um, it could well be that you know, it could well be that people, you know, computer computer renders will, will begin to challenge for for uh, accuracy with with images. But yeah. but I mean that brings up new and other issues. Um, I, but the thing is, I don't think anything will replace um, a photo, you know, a really good photographer's eye. I really like technology, and I like connecting, and I like. Um, um, you know, photography is a very lonely world. You know, and and and, and of all the macrocosms of photography, architecture is probably the the loneliest. I think for me, where is photography going? I think I'd like to see more writing um, by photographers. I think you know, photographers, you know, myself, you know, I said I've written my first ever feature quite quite recently, and. Um, it was really, really, really difficult. Oh my God. I mean, I, you know, I haven't written exactly. anything for like 20, 20 years. So actually I, 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 it was only, I think it was a thousand words or something. Um, and I think I did about 15 drafts of it, but I'm very, very proud of it. But just in terms of you, you think about things in a very different way. So I, you know, I, I'd like to do some more of that. Another bit that brings back to you, you were answering about, uh, uh, you still have to talk about uh, narrative versus um, what architect or a designer briefs you. At the same time, you can add to what Edmund said that um, the digital media or the medium is changing. And a lot of people, I mean, this is confusion in our own mind, but a lot of people say that the writing uh, is to be done keeping the audience in mind or the medium it's going to be written for. So when you write, is that is the medium or the audience is informing your style of writing or communication? I think it's uh, important to write um, and uh, keep in mind, um, you know, not necessarily who you're writing for, um, Maybe you really have to write and, um, uh, you know, um, to satisfy your own curiosity and uh, interest. Uh, you're not really uh, trying to, uh, when you write, you don't try to describe what you know. In a way, it's a research project. And sometimes I uh, got on projects that I knew nothing about. And I wanted to learn and I wanted to know. And this is why I wanted to write about it. And um, first of all, to satisfy my own, satis my, my own interest. And um, I think the best form of writing is, is like writing a letter to a friend, um, uh, to, uh, uh, to one person. Uh, if, um, you know, if you do that, I think you will create a certain interest uh, automatically. Um, and it's not about uh, following a particular style. It's, um, you know, steering someone's uh, interest and, um, you know, share your fascination. This is the most important thing about writing. Uh, sometimes architects ask, uh, what do you know about me? Um, you know, meaning, are you even qualified to write about me? And, um, you know, I want to discover that. I want to discover that in the process of writing. Uh, maybe I don't know. Uh, maybe I will not even discover by the end of, of the piece, but I want to try. And maybe it's going to be more questions than answers. And maybe that's exactly what the audience wants. For example, I can give you an, a, another example. When I was in Australia, I uh, met Penelope Seidler, uh, the widow of great Australian uh, modernist. And I offered her to do an exhibition and she agreed. Uh, and then eventually it led to a number of other side projects, including writing a book. And to, for me to propose uh, writing a book about Harry Sider was a, an incredible, um, you know, uh, act because uh, of, uh, you know, uh, 
um, because, you know, I, I was probably the least qualified person to write about him uh, to begin with, because I, I never heard of him uh, until very recently before meeting uh, Nella Pisadra. And it was uh, my, you know, interest to find out more about him that uh, kind of fired up my interest and my uh, will to, to do the project. And uh, uh, by the time I finished that book, yes, I can probably honestly say that I knew about his work. Uh, all of his family, I've seen uh, probably all of his, so most of his buildings all over the world. I met people who live in his houses. Um, so that was uh, quite a process for me. But in the beginning, I was the least qualified person. I was probably aware of his work less than any taxi driver in Sydney because he is a household name in Sydney. And right before going there, I heard of his name for the very first time. But this is what's happening throughout my career. I find out many things for the first time. And then if it's, uh, if it's uh, really uh, interesting, uh, that's, where you, that's what you go after. And that's how you discover and you might even become, you know, they may, may, may call you a specialist on a particular subject, but I'm always against that. I don't want to be a specialist in anything. As soon as I uh, uh, become a specialist in, in one particular field or topic, I want to move on. I want to discover something else. That sounds like kind of healthy. That's, that, that sounds like a healthy, healthy attitude. I, li I, I, I like that. That could be a sort of like a like a strap a strap line. You don't want to be a specialist. That's, that's, that's you you have to be um, you have to be careful with that attitude because um, you know I'm really not afraid to to not only to shift but completely make 180 degrees turn in my career uh, because I have done it before and I actually want to do it again. I am. Uh, actually looking forward to that. And I'm not uh, uh, trying to identify myself with any particular uh, field. Uh, I'm a curator. I started as an architect. I transitioned into writing. And I look forward into other transitions. And this is what I actually learned from my education from Cooper Union. Uh, it was always about reinventing something. It could never be just an architectural project that you put in front of a jury and defend it. You had to say something new, something completely uh, um, out of the ordinary. Uh, you had to excite them. And, uh, and that's what probably leads a lot of people who go through that kind of education to this perpetual reinvention of who they are. Uh, Edmund, you also do a lot of personal work, um, which is not a client brief or an architect brief driven. Um, like Vladimir says that at times he's writing, he's writing for himself. He's writing more for himself first, then he's looking at the medium um, or to whom he's writing for, it's his expression. Um, mm -hmm. How does that resonate with you when you're photographing and what personal collection you put up together for yourself and and for what and and what does it yeah. uh, what appetite does it satisfy of yours um uh, architectural photography and photography is it's a sort of it's a blessing it's a it's a curse it's it's a calling it's sort of something that i absolutely love doing so so you know one thing that you know um when covid goes away which is hopefully very very soon and and i start photographing again uh, you know, I'm I'm going to be re re um, jigging things a lot more with personal work. You know, put um, a lot higher on on my uh, priorities. So now on my um, website, I mean, if anyone wants to go there, on the there's a there's a print section, um, and you can buy prints and 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 um, and it's incredible. But 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 you know, it's as I say, it's, it just really has rebooted uh, my um, love for. For what it is that, that, that I do, and um, and um, no, it's fascinating. So uh, it's interesting. It's almost like also 
um, it seems to be that there's a, there's a real appetite for print. People are buying prints like crazy. And I think it's almost like um, there's a sort of desire for, it's almost like a reboot, rebooting from digital to analog. People want things that are real, they're tangible, they can touch. And there's a certain sort of irony that, you know, you can just touch, you know, you can look at 10,000 projects in a day just by the, the click of a finger, but, but um, you know, print is dying. But then people are actually, there's more appetite for people buying print. I mean, it's, it's, it's fascinating, really. Interesting. Uh, speaking of uh, prints, I have this uh, hobby. I uh, collect uh, architect sketches, original sketches. And if you, I don't know if you can see it, but if you look behind me, I have a, a whole display of uh, original uh, architects uh, oh, wow. sketches. Like for example, if I show you, can you can you see it? That's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And um, this is from 2014 when I uh, flew to Santiago de Chile to interview uh, Aravena, Alejandra Aravena, and that was before he was given a chance to curate. Um, the Biennale, and I think he's uh, one of the most uh, 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 important architects of our time because he slightly was able to shift where uh, the direction of where architecture uh, went um, from kind of eager centric architecture to eco centric and also uh, with more focus on social and uh, social engagement and problem solving. But at the same time, I'm, uh, you know, I don't always agree with that view. I, I think architecture uh, doesn't really need a direction. It could represent many, many different ideas. And for example, when we talked, uh, he said that um, uh, the biggest threat of architecture is arbitrariness. Um, but at the same time, I would say that arbitrariness is probably the biggest hope of architecture because so many designs are so intuitive and uh, so incidental.